I was managing multiple screens and technology, but um, yeah, I am going to be a substandard Susan substitute because we had last minute sound issues. And so this was supposed to be the Susan and Glein interview, not interview hour, but close-ish. So I'm going to be channeling Susan's energy. <laughs> so Glein. This is your time. Tell us, why did you, why did you decide to write this book? Um, because I had nothing else to do, right everybody? This is how it works. Um, no, I had been thinking for a long time about um, wanting to kind of help more people in terms of leadership development. And you guys know, I just love peer groups and I love this idea of DIY. And a lot of my roots are in not-for-profit where we had no money for development. You know, it was really, uh, it was truly, you kind of had to do your own thing. And so essentially that was what I wanted to do is to, you know, see if I could create, try and replicate the round table process. I know a bunch of you on the call have been through the round table process. So you, you know how hard it is to kind of replicate it, but do the best I could to take some of the best of and then put it in a book. So it could be a handbook for, you know, people that maybe aren't as fortunate as, as fortunate as many of the people on this call in terms of, you know, having the opportunity to do some development. So that was why I wanted to do it. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, uh, so I have it here. I hope others have had a chance to flip through. I, I know there's a couple of folks on the call who um, are totally new to the round table. So this is basically the secret sauce of the, of the organization packaged in a very, I, I mean, honestly, giving, it, it is lovely. It's lovely you're giving it away. I hope that our business is still in business. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, it's good. It's good. So tell us, tell for the folks on the, on the, on the line, what, what caused you to be so passionate about group coaching in the first place? What really drove it? Um, so it was purely selfish. I think I had the opportunity and I know, um, Pam and Anna would know, uh, Trish from um, Trish Hewitt, who was with Harlequin for many years. Trish and I met because we were in a peer group together that um, a friend of mine put together. And it was the first time I'd ever been in a peer group. And at the time I was working through a couple of issues um, that were related to something I was trying to work on at work and then also my career. And I just found it so hugely valuable to be around other smart, like-minded, ambitious people that um, I just got, I just thought, why, why aren't there more opportunities for this? And at the time, like things have changed a lot, but you know, this is going back to 2000. There were lots of groups for CEOs and there were lots of groups for um, entrepreneurs, but there wasn't anything for what I considered myself to be at that time, which was sort of this mid-career ambitious leader. And I thought, where's my tribe? Like, where are the people that I can talk to? And some of you have heard me say this, like, you know, I was at the time running a consulting firm with people who had lots of opinions about leadership, but um, hadn't actually ever had a lot of hands-on leadership experience. So I think for me, the opportunity to connect with other leaders that really knew what it was like, knew what it was like to have to make some of the tough decisions we have to make as leaders, knew what it was like to be dealing with your own imposter syndrome feelings or feelings of insecurity and, and realize that we're not alone. So um, I think that's what really ignited my passion. And then once I started seeing the power of it, started to see, because I started experimenting with different groups, and I thought, you know, we lack community. And um, the other byproduct of the roundtable programs I've always seen has been community, you know, people getting mm -hmm. together and being able to connect. And uh, so, yeah, that's sort of some of the roots to my passion for sure. Yeah. I mean, it feels like that message is um, really relevant right now, quite honestly, you know, trying to find ways of connecting and uniting um, with all of the stuff in the broadest sense of the word. So it just feels like a very relevant book right now about how to really listen and learn from others and not just look, look up, um, but look everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So what was your favorite part? Like if you were to say flip to this page, 
to the people who have the book. We're, we're not <laughs> Everyone should be highlighting and reading every YouTuber. single chapter, of course. But is there, is there a part that you say, oh, see, look, I see Zev, you've got the book, you're there, you're flipping, Jen. I, I okay. Like the romper room lady right now is what yeah. I feel like. <laughs> I see you in the book. And and I see Anna and I <laughs> see Karen. This is where no, if you don't know. Okay, so this is, this is the funny, okay, so I, I'm going to give you two answers to this question. So there are some of you who know me and you know my deep, dark secrets because you've known me for a while. And you know that in the 80s, which was when I was a teenager, I was a very big hair metal fan. I have, I still have my posters. I have my Motley Crue posters. I got my Bon Jovi with his Superman tattoo on his arm poster. I have all that stuff, but I was a huge, Van Halen fan. In fact, my girlfriend, when she went to Daytona Beach, brought me back a bumper sticker, which I still have, which says, I heart David Lee Roth. So there is a quote in my book that is from David Lee Roth. But what's funny about that is I actually didn't put that in the book. I'm giving full props to my editor who just coincidentally found this quote that was so perfect. And then it was from David Lee Roth. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is just way too serendipitous that I get to have a book with a quote from David Lee Roth in a leadership book. So I actually kind of love that. Like I love finding lessons from weird places, you know, like, um, you know, one of my book reviews that I did for uh, the, our recap newsletter on leadership was the Keith Richards book um, a number of years ago. Like I just, I find there's lessons everywhere. So that's my personal little joy in the book. But I think the thing that I'm um, excited for people to try out is the values exercise. Hands down, when we do the roundtable program, um, the number one thing that people, that really resonates with people is the opportunity to um, just dig into their values. And it's often really life-changing for so many people within our program. And what I love about that is, you know, like Brene Brown, who I adore, has really made values in the conversation about values and vulnerability go mainstream in, in the last few years. Um, but, you know, 10 years ago when I was shopping around the round table and the concept, telling people that, you know, we were going to deep dive into values was kind of this crazy concept for a leadership program, you know, for ambitious leaders. And so I'm excited that people are going to get to, you know, self-serve and, and really kind of dive into this conversation and think about it in the context of their career. Um, my husband, we're going to be married 20 years this year read the book. I was shocked. He actually read the book and he came home the other day. He'd been reading it at work and he came home and he was all fired up. And he's like, okay, I've been working on my values. I think I figured out what my values are. And, and I, I honestly, guys, like I've probably been talking to him about his values for the last 20 years. Um, but now that it's written down, he's actually um, <laughs> listened to it and looked at it. But it was just kind of fun for me to see somebody who's very close to my world who maybe um, hasn't been exposed to it, digging in and, and getting something out of it. So that's my probably other favorite part of the book um, is just being able to unleash more conversations about values. Oh, yeah. So. yeah, I think it's, uh, oh, so Daniil, uh, if you can get your husband to read your book, you've arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Angela, I like that you dressed as Vince Neil of Motley Crue for Halloween in grade 11. I mean, <laughs> Maybe we should have added a different element to this uh, book launch line. Yeah. Costume yeah. element. Can <laughs> I get you to read? So it's on page five. You're, do you have your book? Your David yeah, Lee Roth quote. Okay, then you're going to have to me. Oh, and well, I don't need to put on my glasses, actually. Thank you, Leah. So my it's quote, big font. It's big okay. font. <laughs> it's a really big font. Thank God. Okay, so the, the quote is, the best time is during the struggle. The top of the mountain is usually small, freezing, and lonesome. To this day, I'm continually reinvesting myself in something new. I'm not afraid to start as a beginner in anything. And I just, I love that quote so much. And if you know anything about David Lee Roth, he, he is like that. I mean, the guy, he's a complete nut job. You just have to listen to the interview he did with uh, Joe Rogan to just kind of get a window into his brain. But... I mean, he is this really um, continuous lifelong learner and, and uh, adventurer. And I think that for me is what leadership's all about. It's lifelong learning. If you could, if you could put a check mark beside 
I'm done with leadership, you'd make a trillion dollars. You just can't do that. It's, it's one of this evolutionary type things, I think, being a leader. So. Absolutely. Yeah, no. And I think the point that you make about values, I think triangulating on your values is really what helps um, to drive greater purpose in the work that you, mm-hmm. an individual does as a leader. And it makes leadership much more than a, or life in general, much more of a, than a tick the box of, oh, I've achieved this, I've done this, and I'm going to continue. It's that thoughtful exercise of really uncovering your values that is so, so critical. I know we have um, more people that have joined on and welcome to folks as you've joined. Um, if you don't have your video on, we would like you to, because while this is a very formal book launch, we're not a particularly formal group, um, we will be doing some breakouts, some get to know you activities. So this is the forewarning for the introverts in the crowd. Put your videos on and get your smiley faces on. <laughs> <laughs> Before we do that, before we, we move over to any to the breakout, I do want to let you know, so we're doing this Q&A with Klein, so if there are questions that are coming to mind as you're thinking, you can queue them up and type them into the chat. We can handle a few now and maybe a few after the breakout. Um, we're also going to be providing a grassroots revolutionary challenge too, and there will be a special gift at the end. Just going to pause on my talking, see if there's any chat coming up. Oh, Michael, you are asking if uh, if uh, Glein's husband's values align closely with. <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm, I'm, say, I'm saying they better. That was yeah. the way they say they better. <laughs> well, okay, so I'll tell you the funny story, and and some of you have heard me talk about my values. So one of the one of the values that I'll share with people when I'm talking about um, you know the values exercise because. One of the things a lot of people do when they look at their values is they get into their heads around shoulds. You know, I should choose this, or they think of values as being aspirational. I want to be an adventurous person. So therefore, I'm going to, you know, try and choose that as one of my values. And one of my should values is family. Um, And I always say, I love my family. I absolutely, you know, would do anything for them. But family is absolutely not one of my top values. And how do I know this? Well, our values drive our behavior. So here's my example. You know, my daughter used to go to school in a little downtown Toronto school. I was working from home at the time, like much as I am now. And she used to get dropped off at the school bus at uh, 20 after four. And it takes me about 10 minutes, assuming there's no hazards or crazy traffic to go from my house to where the school bus would drop her off. And so it's four o'clock and I think, okay, I got 10 minutes. I can do one more email. And we all know one email does not take you 10 minutes. Like it does if you're lucky, right? Um, And so invariably I would be cutting it so close. I'd get there just as the bus got in or just after the bus had left and she'd be standing there waiting for me. And so we ended up buying my grade five child a cell phone just so I could text her to say mom's on her way. Um, My husband, on the other hand, who value is values, uh, family is absolutely one of his top values. He would have been leaving at 10 to four, maybe even quarter to four every day. There was no way he would leave it until 10 after four, because he would rather sit there 15 minutes early and wait to, um, you know, meet my daughter. So that's how I know family is my top value. What was my, what's more of a top value for me is achievement, trying to get one more thing done. You know, this competition mm-hmm. thing is often I was doing sales follow-ups with my emails. That is, you know, that's probably one more, more my driving values. So um, I think that's what I, I sort of joke around with my husband. And sure enough, when he came home, he said, I think family is one of my top values. And I'm like, no, it's totally one of your top values. I've been telling you <laughs> that for years. So... <laughs> But that's an right. example, and I think that's where digging into these things are really interesting. For all right, us. absolutely, and not not getting caught in that should trap. Like I yeah. it should be my value. Okay, so I do have one question that's come up in the the chat before we go to the breakout groups, and it's from Steffi. Thank you. So, how do you keep momentum with the works? Sorry, with our work with the groups that we deal with. What what keeps that momentum alive? 
um, when you're working with, like when you're bringing groups. groups together. Yeah. To work. How do you maintain that momentum? I mean, I think, I think sometimes, so I think I have two thoughts on momentum. I think one thought I have is, um, you know, my belief is like any coaching relationships have a arc. There's an arc to the relationship. And, you know, you have to think about with some groups, they just come to a natural end and that's okay. It's okay to close it off. It's okay to adjourn. Um, it's okay to transition, right? It, that's life. And so I think sometimes we think if you're, if you're feeling like you're trying to keep your group going, it's actually a good time to step back and pause and say, has this group served its members' purposes? Mm -hmm. And if it has, great, adjourn it. If, however, you want to shift focus and priorities, refresh, that's the time to kind of recommit to, you know, what it is you want to do and, and set new goals for the group and maybe even integrate new members. Um, in terms of other things that we've learned over the years, I mean, a lot of it has to do with variety. A lot of it has to do with um, especially groups that have been together for a while. Um, you can get a little bit you know, less directive and more self, self, uh, self um, starting in terms of the topics and things like that. I'm in a group that I've been in for quite some time. And so now we just all kind of do check-ins and we play around with what's mm -hmm. gonna work for all of us. So I think it really depends, but as a facilitator, if you're on this call as a coach, it is around looking at the energy of the group and then figuring out what do you need to do? Do you need to recontract with the group just like you would recontract with a coaching um, client one-to-one? -one? Right. Hope that helps. Thank you. Yes. Great. Okay. So we are all here together. We're going to do a little meet and greet and get to know one another, which was what we would have done in a live, um, a live book launch. So we're going to Shelby through the magic of Zoom technology is going to match you with three, <laughs> three random people. Um, we'd like you to share your best leadership moment and it could be best from the terms of oh I learned so much yeah um, it's whatever best means for you so you're going to share that best mo leadership moment and also come up with a question that you would like to pose to Glyne when we come back together as a group am I missing any logistic details Shelby I don't think so just uh, as soon as I open those groups, if you haven't been in breakout rooms before, it will um, automatically send you and uh, then it will automatically bring you back in and give you a one minute warning. And it's, uh, it's very prompt. Let's just say that. <laughs> and I think you're, I think you're going to go in there for about how long guys? Like 10 minutes? A little less than 15. Yeah. Like probably 15. 13 or 12 minutes to be 12 minutes. 12 minutes. So you know. <laughs> Alrighty. So I'll send you there now. The two people not. Um, it's going. Sometimes it just takes. It's time. going. Yeah. Okay. All right. There's a number that just came in, 416-487-4442. Can you hear me? Not sure um, what space you belong to. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> uh, Pat and Michael, are you guys still there? Are you guys stuck in the room with us? Because you could stay with us too if you want to. I'm not sure it's saying on my end that, that they're in. Okay. Okay. I, mean, I wonder if maybe okay. they've got their phones too. Maybe. Yeah. So is that okay? I've got some questions coming in. I uh, I didn't realize that the music group and see people that you've you know used to work with. <laughs> I found a I find a round table leader gathers no moss. <laughs> this is a round table. Us trying to keep up with all you guys is one of our big challenges. Where are they now? What are they doing now? 
Hilarious. Well, so I hope everyone had a good breakout and got to meet some people maybe that were totally new and share their leadership lessons. But um, can I ask, hopefully you came up with a, one or two good questions to ask Wine. <laughs> if you want to throw them in the chat. Oh, good. Thumbs up from Daniil. Good use of Zoom there. Um, if you can throw them in the chat, we'll start um, kind of digging through and maybe have a bit more discussion on, on grassroots leadership. Yeah, and when Leah calls you out, you can like feel free to unmute yourself because I'd love to hear like, you know, if there's any other conversation that came out of that, your breakout group, or if you just want to throw a question at me. Just good to put in the chat so we can have organized chaos here. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so Melanie, why don't you, uh, Melanie Campbell, unless there's other Melanies, do you want to unmute yourself and uh, shout out your question for Glyn? Hi, everybody. Nice to see you all. I hope you're all staying safe. For those of you I know, I miss you. For those of you I don't know, stay safe anyway. <laughs> we were talking flying and it was so great. And I've got to commend Shelby for the technical expertise. Thank you very much. Um, and it was so great talking. I had three other women in the group. Everybody had such interesting things to share. We talked until the last 30 seconds, and then it was like, we need a question. Um, but what we're really curious about is, what's your big, your biggest leadership lesson? That's really what we want to know. Oh, oh my God. Okay. My biggest leadership lesson. I think, you know what, the one, the one big lesson, and I'm going to take it back to values, but one of the things that I did throughout my leadership career was I would go into organizations. I'd be super happy in the first year because I was kind of learning. I'd be okay in the second year. And by the third year, I wanted to strangle my boss, like literally wanted to strangle my boss. And I repeated that pattern through many jobs. I've, I've worked in a lot of places. And then I ended up at, you know, this consultancy, MICA, which I know some of you Toronto based people would know and probably remember MICA. And Don McQuaig, who was my boss, but ultimately like such an incredible mentor to me um, and taught me so much about really so many things. But one was about this whole notion of getting really clear on your strengths, getting really clear on what your values are, getting really clear on how to be really in alignment with your employer. And he, um, he was the one who for me, help me see that pattern that I was, I was just running, like I was just running. And the, and the big thing that ultimately I just couldn't run away from was my super high need for independence. I just have the, like, if you saw my values and, and I know my friend Tristan Nadeff is on this call somewhere in, in the sea of faces. Um, we use Trish's IDI tool. And I know some of you have used that IDI tool. I think I score like 99th percentile on independence, right? Which is really wanting a lot of freedom, variety, flexibility, time freedom. And so, um, you know, I really just came to the realization that um, it wasn't about them. It was all about me and ultimately leaning into and following the path, which I'm on now um, in terms of entrepreneurship was probably the biggest lesson. And so I see a lot of people turning themselves into pretzels in their jobs because they're not aligned to their values and they struggle. And, um, and yet, you know, often fear holds us back because we're afraid to have the conversations we need to have. And it's easier to kind of hold on to what we kind of know versus leaning, leaning in, not Sheryl Sandberg leaning in, but leaning in to like who we are. So I think that's probably my big, big life leadership lesson. I could give you a, uh, I could give you total lists of all the places I screw up as a leader. Like that we could. We'd be here all night for that one. And you guys believe, and then Leah and Shelby and Susan could fill you in. <laughs> I don't know. She's pretty Progress, awesome. not perfection, people. Progress, not perfection. Yeah. Well, you know, it was resonating what you were saying, Glenn. Um, just, I think, one on your IDI drivers for a few people. And then also, how can you love your boss for more than two years as an entrepreneur? <laughs> as an entrepreneur. <laughs> Okay, so love that. Impossible. Right. Impossible. Impossible. Um, <laughs> Janie Paroli, you're next in the question queue. Sure, yeah. So our group um, commented on the fact that, you know, while a lot of us have in our lifetimes probably thought about the, uh, writing a book <laughs> and would love to, we were, you know, we've, none of us have. And so we uh, would love to just hear a little bit more about sort of that journey for you and really 
like what were the you know most challenging parts that you worked through and just what kept you going and uh, any insights you could share <laughs> all right so my whole approach to doing things because i've been thinking about writing a book for a long time so my thing is, it's like, why hire a coach, right? Why do you join Weight Watchers? Once you start putting your money where your mouth is, you have no choice. So I think the thing for me, and I give a lot of credit to Angela Loria, who has an uh, organization called The Author Incubator. I met Angela. Angela, you know, her whole sales pitch is, you will write your manuscript in nine weeks. And I'm like, I, I am a power person. I'm like, give me the deadline. I'm going, I'm going to do this. And so that's what really worked for me was the structure, but also she has a process. And I think that's where I kind of got hung up because the hard part for me was at first, I really wanted to write the book for talent leaders, like people in HR. I felt that, you know, we don't use group coaching as much as we could in leadership development programs in our organizations. And I started writing a book that was, that was sort of more written towards that audience. And then, um, I just hated it. And I thought, you know, at the end of the day, what I love to do is work with leaders directly. I am somebody who just truly believes that, you know, the power of community and the collective in supporting you as a leader. And I thought, I want to write to the leaders. So I had to completely change my voice. I had to completely change how I wrote it. And so that book got rewritten I think at least five times. Um, and, but when you're paying somebody, so, you know, you've, I've gone from investing a whole bunch of money with Angela and then now I'm investing a bunch of money with a publisher who really, you know, I think that's the other piece is you need to surround yourself with people who can support you if you're serious, right? If it's something you really want to do. Um, at least I do. I shouldn't say you. I mean, for me, I need that accountability as my dear friend Anna Potosa, who's on this call knows I am a quick start. I'm a three, three, nine, three. I have very little else going on in my life. I'm all about just getting going. And in order to do that, it's helpful for me to have somebody who keeps shoving me in the guardrails. Right. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not an easy process, but if you, if you, if you have something that you really feel is inside you and you want to get it out, it's, it's an incredibly rewarding process for sure. It's like giving birth, painful, but rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> um, and for those who are wondering what 3393 means, that's her, Glenn's Colby, not her Enneagram <laughs> number. Um, <laughs> yeah, my Enneagram is not, there's no threes or nines in my no Enneagram. Threes or nines. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, interesting to work for 3393, I have to say. Okay, Zev, you have a really interesting question next in the queue. Well, before we I ask that, let's go. Why is it interesting to work for a three three nine three? Oh my God! Oh, oh, my God. All, right. all right, all right. That's all that question. Uh, so yeah, so I got to I got to meet Sharon and Linda, which was great. And our question for you is, you know, if you were to put your book into practice, aside from David Lee Roth, who would you include in your peer leadership group? Three people, alive. Oh, like famous people? They don't have to be famous. Anybody in the world Anybody. that is alive, who would you, we were discussing if you'd have the answer off the top of your head or if you'd have to think. Well, you know, okay, so three people that I really, I think would be amazing to be in a peer group with. I mean, the first person that immediately came to my mind was Michelle Obama. I think she is just unbelievable. That woman is brilliant and so grounded in her authenticity. Brene yeah. Brown, I just, I <laughs> can't get enough of my Brene Brown. Um, and I think those, those are two great Netflix specials, right? There. Yeah, I know, right there, right? Oh, yeah. so maybe, well, maybe I'm showing my cards. I've been watching them <laughs> lately. Um, Brene Brown, Michelle Obama, and I think um, there was a speaker, and you know what? And it's terrible because I'm not going to remember her name. Oh no, you know what? So this, not this person, but Esther Perel. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Esther Perel, but she is a relationships um, uh, psychologist kind of in, uh, you know, personal relationships. Like I'm just fascinated by how we relate with other people. And, um, you know, her, she has an amazing podcast. If you haven't listened to it, it's fascinating. It's all, uh, she records counseling sessions of couples that are in trouble and it is <laughs> There's That's a little boy, bit too much relatable in there, let me say. <laughs> but I think those three for sure. 
That's great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, no problem. A little insight into Glenn's world there and Netflix viewing habits as well. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm just mindful of time. We can get a, a few more questions and I'm hoping to get um, Karen and Elliot and Tanya. So Karen Shulman Dupuis, you have a question. I think you entered it. I do. Chat. Yeah. I do. So Glenn, uh, I think it's incredible. You know, I love you. You know, I love you and I love your work and I love the community of people you bring together and you're so incredibly generous with sharing this community with so many others. And when I look at the faces that are here, um, we're a little milk toast. Mm -hmm. We're a little milk toast. So my question, especially in the light of the current political climate is, how do you broaden your reach? And how do you make your knowledge and this skill set accessible to people? Because a lot of people, you know, BIPOC people who are Black, Indigenous, people of color, don't have access to corporate Canada roles and don't have necessarily access to the, you know, the, the gateway uh, into the peer program um, previously as you had it constructed versus the book now, right? Obviously, that's way more accessible. Mm -hmm. But how do you intentionally move forward to make sure that you provide um, you know, you, you, you broaden your reach to those communities that don't have access to this kind of network. Well, first of all, Karen, thanks for the softball question. <laughs> <laughs> you, you wouldn't expect anything less from me. You know that. And I did check this with my group of three. So no, 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 no. I think, you know what, we were, we've been talking about that all week. And I mean, I think one of the things, I mean, so there's, there's obvious things around, you know, reaching out to some of the community agencies and making the book available to them. And, and, um, you know, I think there's things like that that we can do. And in fact, we do do a lot of work with um, charitable sector, um, you know, employees. So we've got, you know, different things that we've done always over the years, because I come out of that sector, right? So smaller groups, marginalized groups, things like that. I do think one of the things that I was talking to one of our big clients about yesterday that we don't do um, is when people enroll, because when we work with our corporate clients, they, they give us people, right? They just right. sort of say, here's the eight people in our program. And I think we can ask the question, you know, we can ask the question about um, diversity to our corporate clients. And so I think that is one thing intentionally I'm, I'm definitely going to start doing. I mean, it's interesting because we've certainly done that in the past when we've seen gender not being represented in the group. But we have not done that when um, it's come to any other sort of diversity, to be honest. So I think that's like on a very immediate tactical scale, I think something that we'll, well, I, no, I think, I know we're going to start implementing. Um, and I think the other thing too is looking to, you know, let's say putting it on the backs of the community because I'm aware of that. But I think if there's things that people see us that we should be doing, for me, it's like bring it on right? Like we want to be part of the solution. And I, and I think, I do think what I, what I really feel about when you bring group, group coaching together, and we've always talked to corporations about our program being really supportive of diversity and inclusion initiatives, because it brings people together to talk. It challenges mindsets. It challenges belief systems. And, and that's why I've never really been a fan of when organizations have wanted to do gender specific, you know, like women's programs with the round table, like I've always pushed to have it be diverse because I think we need all voices at the table. So I think that there's, you know, potentially maybe there's some opportunity in there that really group coaching is going to be able to facilitate a lot of what we need to have happen, which is creating space for understanding and empathy and compassion and all of those things, right? That um, often we, you know, we don't get to in organizations because we're right. Sorry to jump in, you guys. It's Ingrid. Um, I just wanted to, hi. Um, I just want to top up on that because recently when you mentioned Michelle Obama, and I know Claudette McGowan interviewed um, Michelle Obama last year at, at, a, at a conference. And I think, and that was when I first met her. And, and since then, I've had her as a new network for me. And she was at the Bank of Montreal and just moved, I think, to TD. I think it'd be amazing for you to, if you don't have her as a contact or network, already mm. to reach out to her and have a conversation with her about some of this because it was pretty powerful for me to just have one meeting with her and have a conversation and I know there's lots probably that she can probably help you with from that perspective yeah thank you so much this is yeah. getting to know Michelle Obama that's all yeah. <laughs> anyway <laughs> meeting her. I'm just saying one step closer one step closer I'm just trying, just trying to get you there <laughs> appreciate thanks, you thanks for answering <laughs> thanks for answering
Awesome. Thank you. That's a great question, Karen. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Yeah. And there's a chime on in agreement about Claudette being amazing. So mm -hmm. um, great question. Timely question. There's uh, I, I want to try to get through two, two more. We're at 450. So we're going to have to be nice and tight in time. So <laughs> Elliot, can you be speedy in your questions? Good one. Sure. So first of all, congratulations, Glyne. Thank you. Uh, my, my group, which, which included uh, Wendy and Trisha, uh, we wanted to ask you, based on the fact that you've taught so many people so much over the years, what is the key thing or the one thing that you've learned from those you work with? One, th one thing that I've learned from those I've worked with. Self-insight is the game changer. <laughs> And, and, and there's the difference between being, like you can have self-insight, you can be self-aware and do nothing with it, right? So I can know that I have, I can flip my biscuit really fast and go, well, I've just got a lot of red energy and I flip my biscuit really fast, deal with it. I think knowing how to do something and then consciously choosing to do something different, that's the real work. But I think honestly for all of us, you know, this is, this is the one kick we get at this can, like we're, we're here in this life one time. So how do you learn about yourself? How do you uncover more about yourself? And sometimes it's ugly and sometimes it's not nice, but how do you lean into those moments? And I just kind of think that that for me, every leader that I've, I, when we talk about leaders being needing to be quote unquote authentic, the people that I've met in my career that truly are authentic. And I feel very fortunate, you know, we've had over 150, I think, at this point, senior leaders on our podiums, at our events, over the course of the years, we've interviewed, all that kind of stuff. And the ones that are authentic, they have done the work. Like, they do the work. Um, they don't shy away from it. They're super open, and they're constantly looking at not just understanding themselves, but then actioning on it, actioning on it. And that's, that's the part that's tricky. Okay, I'm being the time manager. It's 4.54. <laughs> so, did you want to shift over to the last bit or do you want have feel like there's time for the one more question? Time for one more question because the last bit is like really fast. And then I'm happy to have to close it off at five, but that's just my way. It's so nice to see all of you. Well, and the reason I want to get to Tanya's question is it actually kind of covers a number of questions that are further on in the queue. So Tanya, over <laughs> to you. Amazing. Well, thank you. And a uh, great job line. You must be so proud of yourself, of course. And um, I'm so proud of you. Um, but our question, uh, our group talked about, uh, so Steffi and Sylvie uh, were in a group together and we were talking about how timely this book really is. Uh, coming out right now in the midst of all of these leadership challenges that we have in front of us. Um, working in this virtual world where, you know, many of us um, haven't had to work uh, in this kind of way before. Um, so not only how does that reflect on our teams and the people that we work, we work directly, stay above, I guess, uh, that we're leaving. Um, and how, how do we take this book that I know was certainly written at a time when we're meant to group together and be together in a physical space and apply it in a world that's virtual and uh, pandemic-y? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I was saying to somebody the other day, I mean, actually, I think I've been saying this a lot lately, like we're, we're connected now, but we have no community. <laughs> Right, so we, we've got all this ability to connect, but we're all feeling this extreme lack of community. And I think to me, it, when you do a group coaching program and the kind of the process I've laid out in the book, which is really, and those of you again, who've been through the Roundtable program know this process of getting to know each other, building the trust, building that psychological safety so that you can connect and then going on a journey together. That's what builds community. I mean, the, the fastest way to build relationships is through vulnerability, right? So I think what this does is give a structure and we've been launching programs, you know, um, some of you might even be on the call that are in a program right now that we've been launching programs virtually. Um, we've adjusted time and, you know, things like that to accommodate. But 
I have to say that the groups are in it are um, getting as much out of it as when we were physically there, which is a bit of an aha for me, but I think it's just speaking to the fact that right now we're lonely, we're overwhelmed, and we're in so much uncertainty that there is something about coming together. Like I'm in two peer groups right now with entrepreneurs because I need the support right now. I'm looking for people that are on the same journey that I'm on and can help me get through it faster. Right. And so, um, yeah, I think it's, a, I think it's, I think this is an amazing time and we need, we need to be more of a collective, like forget this old model of individual development, right? Where you go off on a course by yourself or work with a coach by yourself you can do it together. It's so much more powerful, so much more powerful. So hope I answered your question. I feel like I tend to ramble, but <laughs> it's all good. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Nice to see you. You too. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I think why don't we do our closing slides and then people who want to hang out and, and chit chat, I'm happy to hang out and chit chat. And if you need to pop off, I will not be insulted that you were not, I'm not taking notes on who stayed and who left. And if y'all leave, that's fine too. So <laughs> actually Dina had a great idea. Um, maybe before we hop in to the final slides, which people have to hop off. If you have a copy of the book, um, if you want to hold it up, it'd be great to get a group shot of, oh, yeah. of everybody. Yeah. So if you don't have it with you, no worries, but uh, we'll take a smiling face as well. But I'm just going to, um, okay, so cheese. I'm just gonna slide, I'm gonna do it again because I've got uh, I've got a nice full house, so a multiple screen. And that is awesome, okay. Now Thanks, I can share Shelby. my, yeah. The new <laughs> That's great, say, Tina, thank you. Can everyone see okay. the screen? Yeah. So a lot of people always ask me, Glenn, how can I help? How can I help? And I want to give a big shout out right now to the book launch team. So if you were a member of the book launch team, major applause to all of you um, who did such an awesome job last week, kind of getting the word out. Um, for those of you who have not been on the book launch team, no worries, still lots of time to help. And in fact, as a, this is one of the interesting things when you self-publish, it's, um, you know, you, you really do need the help of community to get the word out because as uh, I know some of my friends from Harlequin are on this call, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of competition. Um, so here's what you can do. Posting a review on Indigo on Amazon, that makes such a huge difference. I can't even tell you. So um, when you do have a copy of the book, um, please uh, go and put a review. If you've got a copy of the book and you haven't had a chance to do a review yet, please, please, please write a review. That is just huge in terms of um, keeping the book visible. Um, you can book me for speaking. Um, I am doing tons of virtual conferences lately on all kinds of topics out of the book. If you want to talk about values or strengths or brand or career goals or, you know, how to derail your career, all of those fun topics, um, definitely book me. And then the last thing is to start a group. So um, we've actually got a grassroots revolutionaries challenge for everybody on the call. So if you want to flip to the next slide, Shelby. So here's the challenge. Um, I want you to recruit a group. I want you to get three, four, five people together. And um, if you do it by July 1st, let Shelby know. You can send her an email. And one of our coaches, I've got the happy Susan McKenzie space, but Susan, Leah, myself, one of our other coaches will help you kick off your group. So we'll come and do the first session with you to get you going on a, on a good foot. I would love to see people um, coming together and building these communities. So, um, and we're even thinking, I was thinking actually, and you guys can maybe let Shelby know if you think this is a good idea of creating a group um, for the grassroots revolutionaries um, on Facebook that you can kind of hold yourselves accountable to or pepper in ideas or things like that. So tell me, I, I feel like a lot of us are Facebooked out or grouped out, but if you think that would be useful, we'd be happy to do that. And we've got a couple of thank you gifts for everybody today that one is, was on the pre-order campaign, so some of you might have got it already, but one is not. It's just for you guys. Um, we created a group tracker, so it's an Excel spreadsheet, so when you bring your group together, you can manage it, and super easy. It's all set up. Shelby's done an amazing job kind of getting it all 
turnkey ready to go. And then we've got a quick start guide to help you get your groups going fast. So the book lays out everything by chapter. If you've been to the book website, all the downloads you need are there. Like literally we've put everything up there. I think I must have lost my mind because literally you have everything we've done to start a group. But I would love to see um, you guys doing this. And, you know, Cheryl Sandberg, when she wrote Lean In, created all these Lean In Circles for Women. I would love to see people um, creating these grassroots revolutionary teams to help them manage their careers. And we talk a lot about leadership at the round table because that's where we focus. But I think for anybody, the lessons that are in this book are universal, you know, understanding your values, your strengths, what your brand is. So I don't think it necessarily has to be just for leaders, but um, that's my gift. So I want to thank you all for joining. It was great to do this. I wish we could have done it in person because I could give you all a big hug. But uh, thanks for popping in and uh, being here with us. And if you want to hang out and chat some more and ask questions, I am happy to hang out. But thanks, everybody. Thank you, Glyn. Congratulations. Congratulations. Nice to see Thank you so much. Today. So great. Congratulations. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Everybody. Really proud for you. Big thumbs Thank up. You. Thank yeah. you. Um, thanks. Thanks, thanks to the roundtable team, too. They're yes. awesome. <laughs> the awesome team, too. <laughs> we have the best team. I really do think that. That's great. Thanks, Glyn. Yeah, great to see you, Kim. You too. I will see you again next week. Yeah, sounds good. Hey, Marjan, it's nice to see you. And Alyssa, there's all these people that I'm